hip dislocations and femoral head fractures. This is from the OTA core curriculum, resident lecture series version five. The slides are by Dr. Thomas Moore, Jr., MD. I'm Saki Brahman, and I'm narrating these. And this is the third and final video in this slide deck. We already talked about um, anatomy. We talked about uh, basic workup. Uh, we talked about classification. We've talked a little bit about indications and which cases can be treated non-surgically. Now let's talk a little bit more about operative management and uh, surgical approaches. So operative treatment of hip dislocation with femoral head fractures is frequently required. Uh, the decision regarding surgical approach, technique, fixation versus excision is often debated. These are very infrequent injuries, so we have relatively smaller case series um, of these injuries, so data is not the strongest. Uh, key factors include location of the fracture, like Pipkin 1 versus Pipkin 2. Is it more anterior? Is it more posterior? Is it more inferior, superior? The size of the piece. You know, is it a shear injury? Is there impaction? Is there both? Are there fragments blocking reduction? Is there a posterior wall fracture? These things all play a role in the decision making. So you could do open reduction with or without debridement if there are free fragments in the joint that need to be removed. Um, and you would do an open hip reduction, removal of the incarcerated fragments. These could be small avulsions, maybe Pipkin 1 fractures that aren't reducing, loose fragments from the posterior wall. Sometimes arthroscopic debridement could be an option if you have uh, the ability to do that at your center. Here's a case example, 56-year-old female, motor vehicle crash, uh, posterior hip dislocation with posterior wall and infrafovial, okay, or Pipkin 1 femoral head fracture. So um, here is the fracture post-reduction. You can see there's a posterior wall acetabulum pretty clearly seen. And then there's a small displaced infrafovial femoral head fracture. So because of the posterior wall, this is treated with open reduction internal fixation of the posterior wall fracture, and that's a relatively small femoral head fracture, so it's excised. What about open reduction internal fixation of femoral heads? So this could be for a Pipkin 1 fracture that's large and displaced because um, small fractures can be excised or debrided. I mean, so look at the size of, you know, this fragment here, for example, and this may be treated with, and it's also, you know, not anywhere close to reduced, it's backwards. So this can be treated with open reduction internal fixation. You can see with uh, two compression screws below. A lot of times these are going to be headless screws or certainly countersunk screws. Pipkin 2 fractures involve the weight-bearing femoral head and so generally are not going to be excised. And, you know, ORF can be done um, with plans to approach the fragment according to its size, location, fracture line orientation. So these can be done with an anterior approach, Smith-Peterson, um, possibly for an anterolateral um, approach if you have an irreducible anterior hip dislocation. It's just, you know, you're a little further away um, uh, from, you know, getting to the femoral head, um, but uh, it is an option. Smith-Peterson is a little bit more direct straight down onto the anterior part of the femoral head and the joint. Um, the free, you know, the leg being free allows for hip flexion in other hip positions. You may have to externally rotate quite a bit to get to some of these fragments if you're going to go anteriorly. Posterior approaches can be done, especially for irreducible posterior dislocations. Pipkin 3 fractures uh, are frequently operative, right? You have femoral neck fracture. So in a young patient, you're going to have to do ORIF. Um, identifying these fractures is paramount. So make sure you don't miss a fracture and, you know, uh, go on to displace it. Um, and then if it is minimally displaced and you catch it, you should certainly consider stabilizing that maybe before doing the closed reduction or reduction of the femoral head to prevent displacement. Uh, if you have an elderly patient, you know, and you have a displaced, you know, Pipkin 3, I mean, this is not the case to necessarily try and fix that femoral neck, just like you would in an elderly, elderly patient with a, a standalone femoral neck fracture. These may need to be replaced. What about Pipkin 4 fractures? Well, those are acetabulum fractures, usually a posterior wall, and frequently require ORIF. Um, surgical hip dislocation is warranted um, in many of these cases if the acetabulum fracture requires ORIF and needs posterior approach. Um, 
Sometimes the anterior approach can be utilized uh, depending on the femoral head fracture pattern and then staged to a posterior approach, but usually not. Here's a case example, 24-year-old motor vehicle crash with a posterior hip dislocation, large anterior superior femoral head fracture with a small posterior wall fracture. So one unsuccessful reduction attempt under conscious sedation goes to the operating room, is reduced in the OR, but now once it reduces, there is now an incarcerated posterior wall fragment, which you can see here. Okay, I'm going to say it's maybe right there. So in this case, Smith-Peterson approach, um, the hip is actually re-dislocated and the posterior wall fracture is pushed back out posteriorly. Uh, femoral head fracture is treated with their reduction and uh, lag screws. Uh, and then after femoral head ORAF, there's a stress exam. And it looks like that posterior wall is relatively small and stable on dynamic stress views. So it actually was not treated with open reduction internal fixation. So kind of turned this fracture pattern into just a posterior wall and then treated it like a posterior wall. And in this case, they felt it was stable to not require ORF. So when you're follow-up, you can see there's a little bit of a heterotopic ossification, but it's non-bridging. Let's talk a little bit about surgical approaches. Uh, for anterior hip access, we talked about this before, Smith-Peterson, Watson-Jones, sometimes you could do direct lateral. Cochra Langenbeck posterior approaches are good for Pipkin 3 and 4s. And then the surgical hip dislocation is another option described by Gons. So Smith Petersons are good for Pipkin 1s, that the fragment tends to be somewhat anteriorly if you need to excise or possibly fix it. Uh, some Pipkin 2s as well. And occasionally Pipkin 4 if you're doing combo approaches. The interval is between the tensor fascia lata and the sartorius. And um, it can be tough getting all the way medial on the, uh, in the hip joint uh, without doing a direct head of the rectus femoris tenotomy. Cochra Langenbeck can be done for irreducible pure hip dislocations. Um, you know, if you can't get them reduced, you may have to go and open reduce them or Pipkin 4s with the posterior wall fracture. Uh, extend the hip and flex the knee when you're doing this approach, just like you would with a like for an acetabulum fracture uh, alone, uh, which helps to lessen the risk of sciatic nerve injury. And for those who haven't done, just to think about it, um, you know, you how do you do a how do you tension the sciatic nerve when you're examining for uh, uh, sciatic for sciatica, for example? Essentially, well, you do a straight leg raise test, right? So you basically do the opposite of a straight leg raise test. Uh, to relax the sciatic nerve and take it under as little ten put it in under as little tension as possible, which is the opposite is hip extension and knee flexion. And um, there's some smaller case series that have shown um, that uh, you can also treat these with with surgical hip dislocation. Um, other uh, techniques have uh, shown that um, you know patients who had uh, ORAF uh, or excision of posterior of uh, Pipkin 1 and 2 uh, injuries, as you can see, are going to get treated with anterior or posterior approaches, uh, depending on all the things we talked about before. Um, anterior approach can tend to have less blood loss, shorter operative time. Uh, and in this small series, no ABN in either group, one patient with arthritis in each group, similar otherwise outcomes. Uh, I know you can't click on these links, uh, but there are some nice surgical approach videos in the OTA video library. Outcomes, AVN and arthritis. Uh, in this meta-analysis of level four evidence, they looked at 13 studies. It's actually using Thompson and Epstein classification, and you can see how the uh, rate of osteonecrosis and post-traumatic arthritis goes up um, as you go from types one to one type to type five. Uh, and as we talked about previously, a delay in reduction greater than 12 hours increases the osteonecrosis risk greater than five times. Another case example, 29-year-old female passenger in motor vehicle crash, uh, left anterior hip dislocation, undergoes closed reduction as shown on the right, 
using the Walker modification of the Alice Maneuver. And uh, it's treated closed. Uh, unfortunately, the patient does develop some post-traumatic arthritis, potentially from some femoral head impaction. Um, Dr. Giannoudis, uh, an injury had reported on 405 patients in systematic review uh, of these injuries showing uh, overall 11.8% osteonecrosis, post-traumatic arthritis, also not uncommon. Um, Dr. Scalaro uh, more recently reported on 147 patients with femoral head fractures retrospectively, half treated with ORIF, a quarter treated with excision, some treated non-operatively. Fractures generally went on to union, and relatively lower rates of osteonecrosis in their series, although Pipkin 3s tended not to do well. So in summary, hip dislocation and femoral head fractures commonly occur together. Uh, so they're kind of putting the same lecture here. Posterior hip dislocations are much more common than anterior. Delayed time to reduction of hip dislocations associated with increased risk of osteonecrosis. Treatment of irreducible pure hip dislocation should be approached from the direction of the dislocation, anterior or posterior. Hip fracture dislocations, either femoral head, neck, or acetabulum, should be critically evaluated to determine the best treatment. Post-traumatic arthritis is the most common complication after hip dislocation uh, and femoral head fracture. Osteonecrosis also occurs to a varying degree. And uh, these are our references. Thank you very much, and that concludes our uh, lectures on hip dislocations and femoral head fractures. Thank you.